Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Voter Fun. Thank you so much for coming out in the big small snow that's still on the ground and on the streets. Um, we're just glad to be here. A um, couple of announcements. We have another um, book discussion group, um, Kansas Humanities. Um, this month, we're reading Firekeeper's Daughter. We have about 20 out of We have about 20 copies, so somebody's wanting to read it. And then we have the discussion for the coming. It's a strong social life in the area. And then uh, Don Henry and Kelly Henry are the group of professionals. We talked about the book. We had about 45 people there last month. So it was really good. And so uh, that'll be uh, January 24th at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday upstairs in the library. Um, and then in February, the Garrett is going to be uh, discussing the book The Visual and the Brain, and it's written by Ed Carson. The Visual is on here. And so um, we're excited that she's going to bring that book. Let's look. Uh, and then um, Options is going to bring, I think, the guys is going to bring the therapy dog and talk to, talk to us about what Lou does and how, what he, you know, how he works and what they used for, and he may actually be here. So that'll be that'll be March. And the National Library of will be the night of the 11th. I don't have the authors yet or the speakers lined up yet. I'm working on that. Of course, because I needed to figure out what we were going to do it. Um, and then the, that same week that we're going to work on Saturday, April 15th, with the friends who um, are one of the things that we were working through on the murder mystery is one of one of the library staff members, Judy uh, Feinsorg, our children and youth librarian, is retired as of February 20th. Oh, so, um, she always told me she's a cat. And um, she just does everything, you know. <laughs> but but so we're going to be using her in February, and so we need to be kind of stuck to the out and figure out what we can do. But, um, so, assuming you'll see an advertisement for uh, children slash librarians coming I mean, up, and if you know someone with an education degree or um, a library science degree, they can send me a request and I'll send them the application. I just haven't done the announcement yet because I'm going to shut instead. But you can also contact your relatives and your friends and people who you think can make a good children's library with lots of energy. I don't know if you guys know how much she does. Besides story time, she does story time. She does laps it. She does play with purpose. She does the story walk. She helps with the murder mystery. Um, we do some flower elaboration, works with the schools, um, just so much. All the daycares, you know, and just um, the kind of things that she does. Her two drinks, book for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's just so much. We're going to show you. Just so you know, uh, that's going on. And her retirement party will probably be February 20th on the last day. Retired, probably do it that day, unless you have a reason you can't. Yeah, they have <laughs> What'd you say? It's not big enough. We'll get more information out to you next month, okay? And then, of course, and she also helps operate the youth activity center. She tells Garrett what to do, and then they were welcome to the other. Um, yeah, so name it, she does it. I don't think we need that. <laughs> and then, um, of course, we also have our Spanish classes or our English classes. You don't have to speak Spanish to come to this class. You can, you can speak any language because you can speak English. And um, the way we teach English, you can learn whether you speak Spanish or that Tagalog or German, whatever. You know that. And, uh, 
As you know, probably as of uh, Monday, we'll find the base on Facebook on our website and then on our agent verso, it'll always say when we're closed, which you just had on Monday. So, and um and now I'm going to welcome um, Rick Austin to speak on the book, Life on the Body. For those of you who don't know me, I used to be loud mouth at the veterans office. <laughs> And I was hired, and today I started three jobs. <laughs> I'm a school crossing guard now. Very good at that. I did it in sixth grade. I had a beautiful yellow sash. And I had a beautiful, beautiful press in here that said awesome. I came here and they did same thing again. All I got was the signs. <laughs> okay. And then um, I, my wife, who is my wife Maria, who is the English language uh, learner coordinator at the elementary and middle school, um, lost one of her uh, assistants. So she asked me if I'd like to take it. She didn't really ask. <laughs> He brought a beach start Monday. <laughs> and I said, it's going to snow Monday. Start Wednesday. So, here I am. And then, uh, well, I thought it was like sing time. <laughs> like Lawrence was, uh, come on, let the poem go. <laughs> um, and then I, I'll also be helping in the building. Uh, Pray for me. <laughs> Not only do I live, I love my boss, I have to live with my boss. Flags on the body. I picked this up. I, I've never read a James Lee Burke book at all. I literally didn't even know about it. And um, I saw that this was on uh, the new books um, shelf. Looked interesting, so um, I thought I would read it and absolutely love it. Absolutely love it from day from page one all the way through to end. Um, it was captivating. It was thrilling. Um, it has a cast of characters that most of you know. Some of them in the community here. Uh, Crotchety old men, uh, sexy women, and a bunch of drunk soldiers. I know none of you know that. It does happen. Yes. The book deals with the fact that the the war in the South was not going well, the Civil War. And so the North has actually already captured um, portions of the Southern states. And they are beginning their march through the South to literally um, find the Southerners who are still fighting and do what they can to get them to drop their weapons and to quit. Um, the majority of gentlemen in the South who fought uh, did not drop their weapons. And so when the North came through, there were still skirmishes all over the South. You know, the North thought that they were going to come through. And I mean, they were, the North was already all the way down, you know, at, at, the, at the end of the United States in Mississippi, places like that. And yet the Southern soldiers would not quit. And they did not quit until their commanders finally said, we're done. <clears throat> you know, drop your weapons and go home. 
And that is talked about, that's not talked about very much in the book, but the lead up to that point is, as well as the time after that. So in the book, you have Northerners, Southerners, you have Native Americans, you have people who have been brought over from the islands. When the islands, I mean Honduras, places like that, and who were brought in as slaves for southern, for southern plantations. And one of them is this very attractive woman who has been captured and smuggled in, and she she dabbles in voodoo. She dabbles in intimate relationships, whether she wants to or not, unfortunately. Um, she dabbles in magic. And all she wants to do is live free. <laughs> help me. And so the lead character in this book does, in fact, help her. Let me read the jacket to you. In the fall of 1863, the Union Army is in control of the Mississippi River. Much of Louisiana, including New Orleans and Baton Rouge, is occupied. The Confederate Army is retreating toward Texas and being replaced by red legs or irregulars commanded by a maniacal figure and enslaved men and women are beginning to glimpse freedom. <laughs> that part right there is what I wanted to learn the most about. You know, what happened when the North came through? What happened to those people who was blacks who were slaves? And the blacks who had nothing. And it's interesting that when the North came through, they treated them the same way. There wasn't a whole lot of difference. You know, like the South said that they owned all you can't take these people. I own these people. The North said, no, you don't own them, but and then they would tell them, you're free. You're free, you can go. Where are they going to go? They've never been free. And so the occupation of the South is very interesting. You know, I had always heard in school, you know, that when when the Northerners came through and 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 beat the southern the southern troops, that the southern troops just laid down their weapons and went home. Well, it wasn't like that. They fought. They fought oftentimes until the last day. Um, I had the privilege of spending Christmas. In the South. It's all funny down there, buddy. A whole lot of, whole lot of youngs and, and boys. Come here. I'm like, sir, I'm 60, 65 years old. Okay, boy. <laughs> um, and I noticed, you know, driving, I spent a few days with me in Florida. My son is stationed there at the Army base. Um, and then came up to South Carolina, where my daughter and her family is. Um, and then my youngest son and his wife came up from South from uh, Florida. And we talked a little bit about all the different battlefields <laughs> in the South. And they, very honest, in talking to quite a few people down there. The war's not over. <laughs> I mean, there's not, they're not fighting and killing each other, but trust me, what they thought about during the war and what they think about today, you see rebel flags everywhere. Everywhere. And then it was it was somewhat of a shock to me that. You know, that what happened in his book has not been forgotten. You know, you don't hear people saying the South will rise again, or you don't hear people saying, yeah, you know, 
We didn't really lost, we just kind of went home. But I'll tell you what, in doing some further research after I read this, it said that there are more guns south of the Mason-Dixon line than there ever are north of the Mason-Dixon line. But they're not going to fight us. They're not going to fight us. They're just a bunch of good old boys who like hunt, fish, blow stuff up. <laughs> Oh, but to get back to the book, the book starts very, I guess you could say, inoc innocuous. Yeah. Here is a, a, a white southerner who refuses to fight, so he becomes uh, a medical aide. You know, his job is to go out into the field uh, and or work in the field of hospitals taking care of the wounded and dying soldiers. It was wonderful to know that in both the North and the South, the hospitals took care of the other soldiers. And if a soldier was harmed in the, in, from the North while they were in the South, the hospital, the Southern hospitals took care of those Northerners. They didn't care who it was. They did their best to take care of them. And so there was this, this young 20-ish uh, year old medical assistant who's out for a walk one day, and he comes across a northern soldier sitting on the bank of a river reading what looked like a Bible. You know, and so he just stops and says, you know, sir, are you, are you reading a Bible? He said, and the officer turns to look at him, sees that he's in the rebel uniform, and pulls out his gun and attempts to shoot this young And this medic said he would never pick up a weapon, ever. It shocked him that this man sitting there reading a Bible would then pull a weapon on him, pull a pistol on him and attempt to kill him. They get into a fight and a large rock is found and that's the end of the Northern, unfortunately. And then it talks about him going back to different places down in the South. And some of the explanations of what he saw and what he did um, as a medical aide are tough to read, very tough to read. And we don't think about it because with, with, our, with our medicine today, that's so instant, you can stop blood instantaneously. You know, if someone, if someone's there's a possibility of someone losing a leg or an arm, you know, we have these really nifty tourniquets you can put on right away. And it just stops everything until they can get to safety. And you know, they, they attempt to save those limbs. Well, in, in these aspects, they couldn't. So they couldn't. So they just cut them off. For those of you who don't know, in most instances, if that's my wife, I'm not here. <laughs> okay. I'm at Walmart. Um, in those days, they just, they, they literally give them a big slug of whiskey or whatever they had, put a stick in their mouth, two or three guys would hold them down, and they would cut off whatever appendage they needed. I can't fathom that. This can't just, but then, of course, then you know we had nice. They had nice white hospital beds. You know, covered them in nice clean blankets. And, yeah, it was interesting that last summer my wife and I did a, 
a surge or our, our my family tree. Her family tree comes from Mexico, way down. Well, my family tree came, uh, came from the north, New York, and then the south, Georgia. I had told you before, I, if you stopped in Georgia, you would think I would have stopped to see some relatives. No. I stopped and saw my son, and that was it. We, we need to leave Georgia. I'm from Ohio. They don't forget. Um, you know, but when, once those guys, once those appendages got cut off, those guys were just kind of left out. It was almost like you know, leaving a piece of meat out. And uh, many of them, the majority of them died. Sepsis or whatever. They didn't make it home. Um, the ones who did make it make it home were the ones who were taken care of toward the end of the war because they would just let them go home now. No, we don't need you to stay here, you just go home. And uh, so I found out that my that my northern family. The Austin family had soldiers, Civil War soldiers, in the Confederate prisoner of war camp. And my Southern family, uh, my Georgia family, had prisoners in the North camps. And then uh, two, of, two of each region died in the camps. Um, but when you go down there, there is the history of, of the South has not waned whatsoever. Whatsoever, they're proud to be Southerners. They're proud to be rebels. You know, I'm I'm curious to see what's going to happen as more and more people from the North move down south. I don't think anything. Bad is going to happen, but we might see some northerners driving back north after a, after a bit. But there's a woman involved. There's always a woman And um, she was brought from the islands um, by slavers who went there, literally pulled people off the streets. Pulled people out of their houses, brought them to the Americas, and took them all to the slave markets, uh, the majority of which were either in Richmond or in Georgia. And this one woman was very attractive, very young, only in her 20s. Um, and she was bought by a drunkard. Very large landowner um, who did not treat his people well, surprise, surprise. And her name was Hannah Lavu, L A V E A U. And so, of course, she worked in the house because he wanted to keep an eye. <clears throat> and of course, she had to, she was forced to. Uh, to come to all of his whims and yeah, 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 you can read between the lines. But one day, and then he, he was perpetually drunk. That's all he did. He drank, beat on, beat on his slaves, you know, and <clears throat> whatever. And so one day, one night, he had really. Um, been very rough with her, and the next day she she killed him. with a pair of scissors. Yes, that was really cool. For me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, so with a, with a pair of scissors, she killed him, and then she went on the run um, with a white woman who was trying to help the slaves be free, trying to get them away from their southern. Uh, enclaves or farms or whatever it was, trying to get them away because 
They were treated so bad. They had no rights. 90, 90, more, higher than 90% could not read or write. Um, and if you worked in the, if you worked in the house, you got a special privilege. Meaning you could eat in the house. Nowhere near any other ones, but you could at least eat in the house. Um, but then you were also at the whim of the slave owner. And slaves were just traded. Like we like we do baseball cards. That's how they, they traded <laughs> slaves. So hey, you know, I need lots of rum. Okay, I'll need to be able to her, but then I want three guys, you know, two men and a woman to replace her. It's just crazy. It's crazy. But it, it was what it was back then in the South. And so now here come the Union troops. They're just literally marching through the South. Yes, there are still some skirmishes. But it was interesting for me to read, because I had never had never read this, that many of the many of the Southern troops um, tried to get to Texas, when they were going to regroup in one large army and try and take on the North, just try and wipe them out as they came through. Of course, that never that never came to fruition. But then there are some groups called some groups of men called Red Legs, and Red Legs. What they did, the majority of Red Legs were a mixed group of Northerners and Southerners who would go after runaway slaves and bring them back for money. Oftentimes, slaves never made it back. No? But if they brought back a dead slave, they were still given a little bit of money. So the majority of slaves that they did find <laughs> never made it back alive. There are some, some characters in this book that I think you will really enjoy. There are officers, uh, military officers from the North, military officers from the South. And the military officers from the North, it was very interesting to me that when they came down, they just took over plantations. They didn't care who was there. They did, you know, if you lived in the plantation, they let you live in one room, and they took over everything else. To include the slaves. You know, so you thought that when the North came down and took over you know, a large household full of slaves, that they would allow those slaves to just tell those slaves, you're free, go ahead and go. It didn't work out that way. I mean, they still they needed someone to tend their horses. And they needed someone to cook for them. You know, there were still fields to be plowed, cotton to be picked, and the soldiers weren't going to do it. So the majority of the slaves never, they were told that you're free, but you can't leave. We need you. And so Hannah, getting back to Hannah, when she killed her slave master, uh, there was a white abolitionist woman who was doing everything she could to, to get the, the black slaves out of where they were. So they got together and they ran and they hid in a bayou. They hid in, in a bayou when some red legs came by looking for them because there was a bounty on their head. It doesn't really say you put the bounty on their head, I mean, because the master was dead. You know, so you have to kind of assume that it was his family. And they hid in a bayou where there was, where they found a, a damaged, decrepit boat down in the bayou that they, they didn't really stay on, but they, they kind of stayed around it so that when anyone came, they could dive under the boat and come up on the bottom. Well, guess what was in the boat? Diamonds <laughs> and money. Not Confederate money. And gold. And 
the story tells us that the boat belonged to a group of French hunters. French hunters who um, knew the majority of the plantation owners and you know were good to them and would do kind of keep an eye out for runaway slaves. Well, the boat, uh, the boat was left there. It had been damaged, they're assuming, during a storm. And so many ladies went underneath it and came up. They were quite surprised. But those red ladies were looking for that boat because they had been told that there was a sunken boat full of gold and diamonds and jewelry and cash. So they were looking for it. But in the end, they, the two ladies found it. They didn't keep it, but they found it. And they gave it to some of the uh, southern gentlemen who were nice to them and good to them. It turns out that the northerners, as I mentioned before, were not quite as forgiving as they should have been. And uh, although they didn't treat the slaves as bad as the southerners did, they were still slaves. They were still slaves to them. <clears throat> the book goes into quite a bit of detail about uh, how southern officers came back, came back to their plantations, were treated. Uh, many of them who came back to their plantations, by this time, the slaves were gone. Someone had either taken them or they had been sold out from underneath their ownership. And uh, they really had nothing else to do. They couldn't grow crops by themselves. They were no longer allowed to own slaves, according to the North. There were no slaves to hire. You know, there weren't slaves walking around, I need a job, I need a job. It just wasn't like that. The book is very enlightening. I know it's fiction. No one's fiction, boy, it has a lot of truth to it. Um, Mr. Burke, this is the first book I've ever written of his. It's what looks like 111 books he got. Um, I picked it up because it looked interesting on the front. Flags on the body. I was very glad I read it. It was very enlightening, very entertaining. Of course, there are some harsh realities in there. It's, it's not a book for children. Don't have your grandkids come sit around while you read it. Some of the questions you get, you tough to answer. Why does that lady have to go with that? Um, I'm, I'm now reading my second James Burke book, and I think that I will be reading many more. I enjoy him. Very, very well written. Let me, let me leave you with this. In the fall of 1863, the Union Army is in control of the Mississippi River. Much of Louisiana and Baton Rouge is occupied. I regret that. Wade Lockin, honored by what he observed and did as a surgeon on the battlefield, has returned to his uncle's plantation to convalesce, where he becomes enraptured by a hand. Told you she was good looking. <laughs> And it says that Flags on the Bayou is an engaging, action-packed narrative that includes a duel that ends in disaster 
a brutal encounter with the local Union commander, repeated skirmishes with Confederate irregulars led by a diseased and probably deranged colonel, and powerful story of love blossoming between an unlikely pair. I think that you will enjoy this book. You have my recommendation to read it. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Thank you very much. Crazy questions? This is the first time I've ever talked about the book. No. More and more, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. That's, that's that 1100 page book I read. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Peter Kay or what was the published book? Um, fairly recently. I believe it was 20. Twenty twenty three. Oh, yeah, so it's it's real, and I, I think you've got four books out since then. Okay, he's like fast. He does. Well, and you know, it's got to be described a little bit. What is the book about that you're reading? No man, no man. This is this is as far as I as I can see. This is the only book that he's written so far about the Civil War. Yeah, he writes about he has he does not have one set genre. He writes about everything under the sun. But that's why I say I I I pick this up because I like the picture and I like the flags on the bayou, uh, not realizing it was a civil war. I'm a, I'm a very avid military leader, and this one was about. Uh, um, it, no, he has, he doesn't have series, but he, he has written books that have one character in some of the books. So I, I believe he, in eight books, there's one main character in all eight of those books. I, I'm, I'm not sure what his name is. I know it's a, I know it's a man. Uh, I don't like that for you. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next Friday. Thank you. You can use this while you're talking, and you can use this like that. I teach medicine work, so this could be used for all of us. Thank you. Thank you.